Good morning to you all. A joy to be in worship with you this Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Advent. We can see Christmas from here, can't we? We're all in our finery. I thought we had a theme going today, perhaps for um, Pentecost Sunday, but no, red is most appropriately a fourth Sunday in Advent color to be wearing, along with green. Welcome. If you haven't already done so, please sign in on the Friendship Pew Pad, which you'll find on the inner aisle. We're delighted to have you here. Help yourself to one of the Congregational Church mugs. If you don't have one of those, they're on the back table on the right side. Next announcement has to do with the uh, frog going Christmas caroling today. The frog club, the fully rely on God uh, folks are going to see some of our homebound folks today. And if you'd like to sing along and join the troop, you're most welcome. Any questions, please talk with Pam after the service today. Next announcement. The Tree of Lights. Oh my goodness, we're up to $879 for the hospice program. I think that's the fastest we've moved through that. I'd like to have the Fleming boys come up quickly and and, uh, crank on 18 more lights, if you can believe that. So that, that'll keep them busy for a minute. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for doing that. So, uh, yes, the contributions are going to go to our local hospice here in Douglas County. We know how important that work and ministry is, and we thank you for your support of that. Finally, I'd like to invite Barb Brown to come forward. Barb is the chair of our missions committee. And she's going to talk today about two special giving efforts that are coming up year-end. Well, our last Five for Five offering for the year is the Christmas Fund. And the Christmas Fund is um, an offering that is taken to support retired ministers particularly. Um, There was a time in the UCC church and before it became UCC, when pastors didn't have much for pensions. And there are still pastors that are out there who haven't been part of the pension plan that we have been contributing to for for our pastors here. And so this is a fund that helps um, supply them, and also it helps if there are pastors who um, have crisis and need some extra Uh, can can apply for some money to help with um, some kind of a financial need, whether it be for health issues or some other type of thing that comes into their lives that's unforeseen. And so that offering, there are envelopes on the back table um, by um, the that little one there where you leave your bulletin if you want. So if you want to pick one up, um, you can either put it in the offering next Sunday or Christmas Eve. Um, Kathy, New Year. The other thing, of course, is our ongoing um, Bountiful Basket, and it is, um, it's coming along well. Um, This year, we know it's for United Way, and they have asked for cleaning products, as well as the mittens and boots and socks. So um, if you haven't had a chance to pick those things up or look and see um, if you've got any of those items, Um, You can bring those until also about the second week in um, January. When Kathy Johnson gets back, she'll be packing that up and taking it to United Way. So thank you for your um, giving spirit, and we will help those who need help. I'd like to invite all, all who are able to please stand and just take a moment to greet those around you. It's wonderful to be here in worship at First Congregational United Church of Christ where people believe, belong, and become. Good morning. Good morning, John. (laughs) Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning to you. Good morning, Randy. Please do be seated as we continue in worship and prepare to light our fourth Advent candle today. Thank you.
past wrongs that prevent us from moving forward. For any regrets that still trouble our soul. For relationships left in decay and neglect. For any action that has wounded us or by which we have been wounded by others. Grant that we might all have the peace of Christ as we wait, the love of Christ as we act, and the grace of Christ as we speak. The, the writer of Revelations 21.4 describes a wonderful day which is coming when hurt and pain are no more. Re Revelations 12, 4 And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. This morning we light the four candles. The first candle is the light of hope. For those in time of waiting. The second candle is the light of hope for those who are wearied by the circumstances of life. The third candle is a light of hope for those eagerly waiting God's promised glory. The fourth candle is the light of hope for those who carry the wounds of life. Today, we acknowledge our pain and the pain we have caused others. As the light shines, we turn to the Savior who came to rescue the lost, to help the hurting, and to bind up the broken.
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. I'll begin. Before the majesty of God, we gather to worship. In quiet expectation, we come to hear God's promises. This, this is, is where, where we, we belong, belong in, in this, this holy place. place. Surely God, God will feed our deepest deep. hunger. Before the mercy of God, we expectantly lift our hearts. In humble imagination, we ready ourselves for a new visitation. Even in these dark days of winter, God is present with us. We feel the warmth of God's love. Surely God is preparing us for the dawning of great joy. Please be seated. Anyone here today who has a Facebook account knows right from the get-go how it connects you very quickly with loved ones and friends literally around the world. And it's kind of a potpourri, a, a calliope of various connections that you make. You can see cats playing a piano in a video somebody posts or or the everyday life of friends, what they had for breakfast, and uh, all manner of other interesting topics, should you choose to dwell on them. This past week, there was a post by Lori Hill Alford. This is Sandy Hill's daughter. And it's very timely, the conversation these days uh, in all political circles, and certainly one of the uh, topics that will be at the forefront in this year's election, next year's election, is that of immigration. 
So reading with her permission, I'd like to share her post. With all the negativity surrounding stories about immigrate, immigrants, I felt I needed to share a different kind of story. As mom has continued in her rapid decline, she no longer is able to differentiate what is real or imagined. One day, she's been beaten and thrown in jail, according to her thinking. Another day, she spends our entire visit picking bugs off a blanket. And yet the next, she's ready to go Christmas shopping with me. But here's the thing. She doesn't live with me. My family has given her over to the daily care of a host of immigrants. Of English-speaking people, nor do they have last names like Anderson or Olson or Johnson. We call them Pete or Charlie, but I know that's just for the ease of identifying them. These loving men and women help my mother to the toilet. They assist her in her showering. They dress her. They cut up her food for her and even take time to use the curling iron on my mother's hair. I watched Pete just yesterday feed a cookie to another resident, one bite at a time, much as we do with our young grandson. Patient, encouraging, and kind, I am humbled. Who are these loved ones? Where are they from? What are their special holidays? These are also men and women that, uh, that help make our nation great. They have the same worth and value, and maybe more in my eyes, than any single person, plain politician, flopping about America, making America great again. We need to affirm human dignity. That's what makes my mom's caregivers, all of those immigrants, my teachers, great beyond measure. They are truly great Americans. End of quote. As we enter this time of prayer today, I would call to your attention not just the immigrants, but all people that, for whatever reasons by our culture, have been deemed less worthy, less valuable, less important. The downtrodden, the down and outers, the outcasts. These are the ones Jesus had a special place in his heart for. We see it repeated over and over again. As we go into this time of prayer, we keep our families and our friends and our loved ones and our newborns and our aged all at the top of our prayer list. But today, maybe just today, let us lift all people into the light of God's blessing and God's love. Join with me first in a time of silent prayer as Margaret plays quietly. I'll share a brief pastoral prayer and we'll conclude today with the Lord's Prayer using debts and debtors. Will you join with me? Loving God, creator of all humanity, we bow before you this morning, aware of how we have been so richly blessed as American citizens. All of our lives we have had opportunities and privileges that very few of our neighbors in other countries enjoy. Warm places to live and meaningful work and opportunities to grow, to learn, to serve, to become the people that you have called us to be. I would ask this day, O oh God, in this season of light and hope and possibility, that you would illumine our minds with the truth of our neighbors, 
right here in Alexandria, here even in the state of Minnesota, as prosperous as we are, old and young families and individuals who are struggling to make ends meet, those who go from couch to couch and home to home, some even sleeping in their cars on cold winter nights. These are the ones Jesus has called us to pay particular attention to. These too are your loved children. These too are our brothers and sisters. And so, O oh God, lift up our hearts. Raise our awareness. Strengthen us as we seek by your grace to serve in the name of Jesus, the coming Messiah, the Christ child to be born. May we, O oh God, by our words and actions proclaim the truth of the King who comes from the heavenly realm to bring the blessings and the light and new life that you offer us through him. And now hear us, O God, as we gather together proclaiming who and whose we are in the prayer Jesus taught us as his disciples, saying with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. An invitation to give. As we prepare our hearts to give, we remember the greatest offering of all time, God's gift of new life in Jesus Christ. The appropriate response to such a gift is the giving of ourselves. What we place on the altar today symbolizes the depth of our commitment. May we show how thankful we are. Will the ushers please come forward? Please join in the unison prayer of a dedication. You may, be, may remain seated. Thank you, God, for your mercy and protection, for feeding us physically and spiritually, for caring for us like a good shepherd. We present our offerings as an act of gratitude. In the name of generosity we cannot match, we seek to be generous toward others. May these offerings do far more than support our church. 
we dedicate ourselves and these gifts to honor Christ through ministry in the world. Amen. The scripture reading this morning on which our homily is based comes to us from the Gospel of Luke in the second chapter, verses 15 through 19. Hear the good news. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and that little baby who were lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary, she treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. Here ends the reading of the Holy Scripture. I love the story told about the day after Christmas at a church in sunny California. The pastor of the church was looking at the manger scene in the narthex of the church, and he noticed that baby Jesus was missing from the cradle. He immediately turned, and he went outside, and he saw a little boy with a red wagon walking down the street, and sure enough, right there in that red wagon, wrapped in a purple blanket, was the infant Jesus. So he walked up to the boy and he said, son, where did you get that little baby Jesus in your wagon? And the little boy and why did you take him? The pastor asked. The little boy replied, well, about a week ago, I prayed and I told Jesus that if he would bring me a red wagon for Christmas, I'd give him a ride in it. <laughs> when you think about it, all the truly saving ideas that we know are born small, to understand the forces that direct and shape the future of our lives in this world, we must be aware of that which is small and germative and diminutive, at least unremarkable, downright tiny, like the Bible's proverbial mustard seed. For those of us so blessed to be born here in the United States, this is a difficult concept for us to get our heads around. The problem is that we've seen too many larger-than-life blockbuster movies. Has anybody seen the new Star Wars yet? <laughs> I'm hoping to go tomorrow. Was it good? <laughs> it was good, all right. <laughs> the mega malls and the gigabyte realities of our lives and our culture make it so hard for us to understand that the show under the big top isn't really what matters most or lasts the longest. As it turns out, the most influential events in our lives are not those noisy affairs that split our eardrums, but rather that which is embryonic and secretive, almost unnoticeable. The birth of Jesus is like that. When you think about it, God's chosen manner of coming into the world is really pretty low-key, almost casual, which is to say God shuns the everyday and the ordinary. And what could be more ordinary than a birth of a little baby? Unless, of course, it's your new granddaughter. But generally speaking, God has a way of appearing to be less than what God really is, appearing as a little baby boy born into poverty and obscurity. A child born to a young mother out of wedlock in a little backwater town called Bethlehem seems odd to us that God chose the earthly disguise of an ordinary Jewish man growing up in a common carpenter's family. A young man who gets into trouble with the law and refuses to answer the questions and accusers. A liberator, a savior, who later enters the city on the back of a lowly donkey. Yes, it's true, God comes into our world and lives and such a common, such an ordinary way that the masses looking for the big show may fail to see it altogether. But God chose to be born into a dark and hostile world 
a world far different from the serene ones depicted on our Christmas cards and described in our annual Christmas cantatas and children's pageants. We know that Palestine in Jesus' day was a land of disease and poverty and economic unrest. It was a land controlled by the Roman Empire, two-thirds of whose inhabitants were slaves, able to be sold as property and punished or killed at the discretion of their owners. Magicians and soothsayers abounded, and barbaric struggles between men and beasts were common and a popular form of entertainment in the Roman Colosseums back then. Historians tell us that in a typical month, 20,000 lives would have been sacrificed in the arenas. The world of Jesus was a world where worship of gods was rooted in fear and superstition, And yet, oddly and surprisingly enough, it was into this dark and superstitious world that God chose to be born. The time and place were not what we would have chosen or expected of our Savior. The good news for us today, nestled in this amazing biblical story, is that if the light and the love of God could be born into those horrible, dark conditions back then, well, surely... God can be born into our world today. But to receive the gift, we must be open to the new and the surprising. If we're to be open to the new ways that God can enter our lives today, instead of coming into our homes and our churches, maybe we need to look for the advent of Christ on our streets, on our college campuses, in our scientist labs which is to say to be a hope-filled people as we are called to be today, we need to be able to see God at work in such unlikely places as Wall Street or Congress or in the midst of the last mass shooting. When you think about it, God's advent coming into these kinds of places is no stranger than the holy birth in that stable long, long ago. The simple truth is that God did not come then in places that people expected, and God will not come in any expected way into our lives either. But there's more, a little bit more to glean from this story of Jesus' birth. Note that God's way of choosing the poor and the humble, reversing the way that we look at things, suggests something for us in the church today. Think about it. If if God shows such a preference for the weak, for the humble, for the poor and the needy, the outcast and the immigrant, shouldn't that provide us some clues as to how we ought to order our lives and direct our lives today? Luke captures the essence of this upside-down, topsy-turvy reversal of the world's value system in the first chapter in his gospel when he writes, quote, He has scattered the proud in their imagination, He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the rich away empty. If we're honest in regard to our faith, and we are once again confronted with a troubling and telling question. Can the church of Jesus Christ truly be Christian if our faith and our actions do not clearly demonstrate as Jesus life and actions demonstrated a preference for the poor, the disadvantaged, the outcasts, the oppressed people of our day and our age. And if this question truly stirs us as it must, what will we do differently in this church and First Congregational United Church of Christ in the coming year, in 2016, right on the threshold? 2,000 years ago, God gave the human race a tremendous gift. And we... A young woman, probably only a year or two older than our middle school-aged children, gave birth to a baby born in a barn. He grew up to be a great soul, an amazing teacher and preacher. He was fully human. The Bible is very clear about that. Eating and sleeping and laughing and crying and hungering for justice, getting angry when he saw injustice, doubting, and finally laying down his life for those that would be called the outsiders, the poor, the oppressed, the disenfranchised, the outcasts. 
And very soon after his death, people began to see much more in this man. They saw Jesus differently. Perhaps they began to look at the life and ministry of Jesus and say, he was truly a man of God. That's what God would do. That's what God would look like if God came to earth. The Bible says that Jesus revealed God's nature, God's true character. But, we know, but you know what? Jesus also revealed our nature. Jesus was God's supreme gift to all of humanity, a gift that promised food to the hungry and clothing to the naked and care and compassion to the sick and liberation for the oppressed and new sight, new insight for those who had no vision. And that is still the gift we need today. There's no doubt about it. Receiving this gift from God in the person of Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem, is way different than getting an iPro, an iPad Pro, or an Xbox One, or a new Lexus with a big red bow on top. Rather, the birth of Jesus is the gift of the surprising and the unexpected. At first glance, such a gift may seem a little disappointing, but the joy and celebration of this gift centers on the happiness we Christians experience in practicing charity and justice throughout the year. Perhaps the whole world would be better off if at Christmas and throughout the entire year we, quit, we Christians emphasize to our children God's advent coming into the ordinary days of our lives. And maybe we would all feel just a little bit better and have a deeper sense of meaning in our lives and perhaps even a little more integrity whenever we join together in singing the beautiful Christmas hymns of the season or even when we recite the ordinary and common Lord's Prayer, asking that God's kingdom be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Please join me in a prayer of invocation. Creator in heaven, our hearts are warmed by the season of Christmas. We love the sights, smells, and sounds, the joy and the light, the gifts and the gatherings, the family times, the traditions, and tearful nostalgia. Some of us, however, enter this season with fearful anticipation of the stresses it can bring. For some, our memories of Christmas's past may not be all pleasant. For those and for all of us gathering, we pray that this retelling of the Christmas story, the story of your infinite love for all humankind, will so captivate our hearts that we will be bursting to go tell it. May Jesus, your Son, who came to be our Savior, be our focus as the plan for our redemption unfolds in song and story. May the Holy Spirit enter each of our hearts and give us a fresh perspective of your sovereign purpose. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
goes out to worship Christ the King, the Messiah, just as the heavenly host have worshipped the triune God since ancient times, may we worship him together. Just as the shepherds were astonished at the angel's news, may we be awed by the presence of the incarnate Son of God. Just as the Magi left their contemplations to seek the Messiah, may we seek to worship him. And just as Simeon and Anna recognized his sudden appearance on earth, may we experience the consummation of our hope and expectation in the person of Christ as we worship together. The voice of God was silent. No prophet of God had spoken for 400 years. The ancient prophecies remained, but the spiritual darkness seemed to be steadily encroaching on the people of God. Many could not endure the interminable waiting for the promised Messiah and simply gave up. But God always has a remnant, a faithful few who never stop believing, never stop expecting. People of hope such as Zechariah and Elizabeth, Simeon, Anna, and Joseph and Mary. Through the silence, through the darkness, the heart cry of the people of God was, Come, Messiah, come.
The shepherds had not wasted any time in traveling to Bethlehem, and there weren't very many stables to search in this small hamlet. So they came upon the new little family rather quickly. For Mary and Joseph, the night had been filled with uncertainty and apprehension, the pain of childbirth, and the tension of their squalid surroundings. But when the Son of God was born, Mary wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him on the soft hay of the manger. As the shepherds entered the stable, Mary picked up her newborn child and held him in her arms. The silence of the ages returned, but now it was a silence born of awe and wonder, the silence of unspeakable joy, and the reality that all were in the presence of Christ the King, the Messiah, the Savior foretold by prophets and angels. Mary quietly pondered the powerful essence of this reality. The Son of God had come to earth to do his Father's will. Mary was a very young woman when it was revealed to her that she was the chosen one to bear the Messiah. The angel Gabriel, who appeared to her with this revelation, announced that she was highly favored. If anything, this was an understatement in Mary's mind, because every Jewish girl that they could be the mother of the coming Messiah. After the astonishment wore off and Mary's initial questions were answered, her response to the angel was one of abject humility and complete submission to the will of God. She said, I am the Lord's servant, be it unto me according to your word. Mary was also known to be a thoughtful, reflective woman one given to pondering the implications of events happening around her. At one point, she burst into joyous song of praise, magnifying and glorifying the Lord for his grace to her and to all humankind. She was obviously a woman of the scriptures, quoting freely from the Psalms and acknowledging her, acknowledging her faith in the word of God and the ancient prophecies. 
we sometimes wonder what she may have expected from her unique child. As she was watching him grow through childhood and into maturity, did she have any inkling what his life would be like since he was the very Son of God? We know she considered him to be her Savior. She delivered him into this world, and he would one day deliver her from this world. Did she anticipate the miracles of healing? Or raising the dead to life? Did she ever think he would walk on water? Or calm a storm with the sweep of his hand? Did her ponderings ever include the wonderful awareness of his personhood and his eternal titles? For every true believer down through the centuries knows implicitly that Mary's little son is God incarnate. He was and is the Lord of all creation and the ruler of the nations. Mary's sleeping child was heaven's perfect lamb. And, and the, the great, great I, I am. am. It was a perfect moment for pondering, really, a holy moment, in a stable, in the town prophesied hundreds of years earlier by the prophet Micah. The silence of the ages descended once again on this holy night. It was the profound silence that comes from peace. 
ultimate peace, because the Prince of Peace was born. Lord at thy birth, please continue to sing with us as we honor Jesus as Lord. Oh, come, let us adore him.
the beautiful Christmas story every year is rewarding and reassuring, but we need to do something with it. We need to do what the angels did and what the shepherds did and what Jesus commanded his people of all ages to do, and that is to go tell it. Please join the congregation. Remain standing as we sing. Go tell it on the mountain, as shown on the screen. Thank you. 